underneath here. There, there is metal. Don't worry. It's not. You're just not talking glass on glass for the display. But one drawback is there's a little bit of flex to the lid. Now a lot of laptops have flex on the lid. That's nothing new. But if you compare it to the old ZenBook. UX31A, the outgoing model, that one had a very, very rigid aluminum lid. Here, this one, I can, you know, twist, do a little bit of twisting. It's not as much as on a Sony Vio Pro 13, which is disconcerting for some people, but a little bit. Anyway, not the first time we've seen glass on the lid. HP actually did it first with one of their early Spectre models, and then uh, Acer did it with the Aspire S7, really lovely machine with white Gorilla Glass 2. This is Gorilla Glass 3. So far, I haven't heard of a lot of people complaining that they've had their lids cracking on this. Of course, Gorilla Glass, especially Gorilla Glass 3, since it gets better with every revision, gets thinner, more scratch-resistant, and more shatter-resistant. That doesn't mean that you can't. I would not, obviously, well, swing a, a ZenBook UX31A at it, for example. I'm sure something bad just might happen. But if you're worried about scratches, ASUS themselves have a demo video where they do strange things, like they take a knife and a fork at it, a screwdriver, it doesn't scratch. Pretty hard on the Moore's scale of hardness. Of course, some sand, silica sand, can be even harder than glass. So, well, if you're going to take it to the beach, don't rub it on the sand a whole lot. That said, very pretty, unique, functional reason. Allows for a thinner lid, which is interesting because when HP did this for their very first model, actually the glass made it even thicker. So at this point, it is a slimming feature. If we take a look from the side, it cuts the usual kind of ZenBook tapered look. MacBook Air inspired certainly, a lot of Ultrabooks are. So it's good to see ASUS do a few things like the blue color and the Gorilla Glass lid to set themselves apart. Very slim, very attractive, one of the thinner Ultrabooks on the market. 0.6 inches at its thickest spot. Obviously the front is thinner and has taper on the sides to make it look thinner than it actually is. Closes with the satisfying thunk, like a nicely tuned car door. Or again, like a Mac laptop or any higher end laptop. Bottom is metal. Blue, everything here you get blue. So this is your good old fashioned metal held down with some Torx T5 screws. You can get inside here if you want, like most Ultrabooks. Not a lot to do once you get inside. But aha, uh -huh, one more interesting thing when we open it up. First off, that's as far back as it tilts because you see there's a little lip that hangs over here. It gives it a nice stylish look and it raises up the back for more comfortable typing. I have not found it uncomfortable because it is rounded. This is not a sharp edge at all, it's comfortable. But anyway, when we open it up, Notice here, it's an interesting looking finish. This is not plastic, folks. This is also Gorilla Glass. They call it ceramicized Gorilla Glass, and it's, it's sort of a matte finish, and it feels a lot like the surface of a glass track pad. It just feels silky and really nice. So again, another interesting touch allows them to make it pretty thin. Feels more comfortable. This base here, ultra rigid. You can't flex the base on this at all. Likewise, the, the keyboard is nice and firm. There's no trampolining. You push down. Typical of ZenBook machines, it's very, very rigid there. Big glass trackpad. The only thing I can say is that the surfaces are not very different, but there is a distinct lip here, so you'll feel it if you want it off, but it feels pretty much identical rubbing your finger in either place, so that's nice. As you can see, the keys are black backlit, and you know, unless you angle it like that, you're going to see a little light out of the sides, but generally speaking, light bleed from the keys themselves is very well controlled and it's very pleasing. Maybe not as beautiful, say, as the Samsung Atibook 9 Plus, which has the most beautiful backlighting I've ever seen. Also, the Acer Aspire S7 has very pretty EL backlighting on it, but one thing I would say over the Acer Aspire is this has a normal keyboard layout. The Acer Aspire Keyboard is just a little bit weird with their combo of function keys embedded on the number keys. They reduce the height on it. They do some interesting things with some of the side keys. Completely normal keyboard, easy to type on. Pretty good key travel. You can see that's a, for an Ultrabook, that's a pretty good amount. Nice tactile feel. Not as ooh la la as the Dell XPS 12, which is just with its contoured keys and its nice travel, just one of the nicest keyboards I've ever typed on. But this is highly confident, not a complaint. I can type all day on this. But anyway, this actually leads to another topic. There's also an ASUS ZenBook UX302. Sort of like the way there was a UX31 and a UX32. Same thing going on here. We've just added another digit in. Now, depending on the country, and we're going to talk about the US first, Best Buy has a UX302 and it's only $9.99. And it's your basic standard $9.99 Ultrabook. The features there are comparable to all the other Ultrabooks on the market for the same price, Core i5, 
dash 4200U, 128 gig SSD, full HD display on it. That has a metal keyboard deck here. It still has the same blue Gorilla Glass on the back. Metal on the bottom, a little bit thicker, a little bit heavier. So there you go. So if you like the styling of this, if you're somebody who says, you know, I just use Word, I use Excel, I browse the web, I play some videos, I don't need all that kind of horsepower thing, then consider that one. If you don't mind the full HD display, 1920 by 1080, which is certainly a nice enough display right there. But, but that leads to the display on this. See, the nice thing about this model is, okay, let's talk about the price. Goes from around $1,600 to over $2,200, depending on the configuration. What we here have here is the $1,999 configuration. You might find it for $1,900 even on Amazon. Best configuration bang for the buck, I would say, if we're going to go for this. So what's better about this? First off, it's the display. Here we have a Sharp IGZR IGZO, if you want to say it that way, display. 2560 by 1440 resolution. Obviously, you can see the glare there. It is a glossy display. One of the nicer displays on the market, Sharp, sure caught up a lot of attention. In 2013, when they announced these displays, we haven't seen them on too many machines so far, but we've got it right here. So very high resolution, and IGZO stands for Iridium Galenium Zinc Oxide. It, it's a new substrate underneath that allows a lot more light through, because once you get to these super high resolution displays, the, the density of the pixels reduces the background lighting. We saw that issue with the Samsung T-Book 9 Plus and the Lenovo Yoga 2 Pro, both using the Samsung 3200 by 1800 display, which adds as RGB, red, green, blue pixels, and a white pixel into the matrix to try to improve brightness. And one of the things that suffered was the quality of yellows. It uses more power to display yellows accurately, so we saw some firmware updates and little fixes and things to try to make the yellows look better when they're unplugged. This doesn't have that problem. This actually is very light efficient, lets a lot more light through, much brighter. And indeed, this is a 365 nits brightness display. And depending, you know, panels do vary one to the other. ASUS is claiming up to 400 nits of brightness. This is not a particularly bright background here. I don't even have the brightness turned all the way up. And it looks great. You're getting a sharp display. It's very high resolution. It doesn't quite match the Samsung in terms of actual pixel measurements. It does match our 13-inch MacBook Retina machine. Uh, honestly, one, at 13.3 inches, it's enough pixels. Any of those machines, that's crazy. But how about colors? This actually did extremely well when it comes to color gamut. And we're going to take a look at the visual proof of that. One of the best so far. Now here's our Adobe RGB 79%. So far the top displays we've looked at, which includes the Samsung T-Book 9 Plus, the Sony Vio Pro 13, the Duo 13, they've been at 75%. So we've hit 79% here. Very good for Adobe RGB. Graphics professionals will appreciate the really high resolution display and the accuracy. 98% of sRGB. So very, very good color coverage there. Nice to see. Contrast is pretty good at 500 to 1. Black levels are quite good on this. So how about viewing angles? Let's go to our desktop here. Now I've picked a panel that has some pretty prominent reds in it. Because the one thing that I notice is when you turn this sharp panel to the side, other than the fact you're going to see some glare there, the, the, it's very sharp. It, it doesn't lose any, if you're reading text or something like that, it doesn't lose anything. But you'll see as you go to pretty extreme angles, you'll start to lose some of the reds. So, not quite the viewing angles that you see on an IPS display. Uh, very legible, again, but reds particularly color shift. The greens and the blues, not so much. The blacks, no, they don't invert. It's not like a nasty TN panel or anything like that. In fact, I think most people look at this and say it's pretty nice viewing angles. But you will notice the difference if you angle it forward, if you angle it back a little bit. Some changes. There is a sweet spot that you can find where it looks the absolute best. And that's just something that's inherent with this sharp display that's used in this. Nice technology, overall really nice. It's, you know... If you're looking at this or the T-Book 9 Plus or the 13-inch Retina Mag, no matter which way you go, you're going to get a really nice display. That's all there is to it. This one is particularly nice, though, because it is brighter than the others. I like bright displays. I confess that most of the Ultrabooks we review, say they have 300 nits of brightness, which is considered pretty good. When I test them, I put them at about 50%, because that's what you're supposed to do. When I use them, I always have them at like 70% or higher. This, this I keep at about 50% or so, because anything beyond that is just really bright, unless you're in a super bright room. So nice point there. So how about the internals on this guy? I, 
this is another thing that sets it apart. You're going to pay that much money. You better get more than just good looks. So there are some ultra books that do trade on just their good looks and high style and fashion conscious folks are going to buy those or those who are in executive positions want to look good. With this one, you can get them both. The base model, which is around 1600 bucks, I really wouldn't that much recommend. That has the usual Core i5 1.6 gigahertz dash 4200U, all has well inside by the way. You do get 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD and that's in a RAID 0 configuration for that price. But with this one here you move into something that's actually unique among Ultrabooks right now. Uh, Ultrabooks, the U-series ones, the 4200U, the Core i7 4500U, they run on 15 watts of power. That's what their power platform is. This guy is special. This is a special line of CPUs. Runs at 28 watts maximum with Intel Iris 5100 graphics, not the usual HD 4400 graphics. So you're getting a good graphics boost there. You're also getting good CPU performance boost on the order of 20 to 25 percent over a Core i5 4200U that's in most Ultrabooks that are around 9.99 on the market right now. That's the Core i7 dash. 4558U in here, 2.8 gigahertz. That's the base clock speed, not the turbo boost speed, which is 3.3 gigahertz. Now, what gets interesting here is not just that you've got faster clock speeds on here, you have Intel Iris 5100, which is pretty darn nice to have, but the fact that you've got 28 watts of thermal headroom, a lot of Ultrabooks that run on the usual Core i5 and i7 42 to 4500U, they have to cut throttle back a lot to stay in their power envelope. It's not that they're getting too hot, it's that they have to stay within that 15 watts for the platform maximum. That means your, your integrated graphics and your CPU. Here you have a lot more headroom, so you get a lot more sustained power. Which gets into who is that machine for? I, this is for somebody who actually needs some processing power. Again, Word, Excel, streaming Netflix, you don't need that kind of power, but for those of you who do a lot of Adobe Photoshop image editing with large JPEGs or RAW files, you edit video, you want to play games on this. Much more worthwhile experience, much smoother. It's kind of like the Lexus versus the Miata. It's just smooth operator. And that carries right down to the cooling. Asus, they make the Republic of Gamers gaming notebooks, they know a lot about cooling and they've taken that technology and brought it here. Now Samsung did the same thing with the Ativebook 9 too. They they also use dual cooling fans in here. If you have two fans you don't have to run them so high you get more efficient cooling. They can be much less annoying and loud. So with this guy sitting here doing this, if I was using Word, if I was using Excel, if I was browsing with IE or something like that, you probably you wouldn't hear the fans kick on anyway. It's pretty much passively cooled. But start to stress it some and you'll hear the fans but again it's sort that Lexus interior feel. Not loud, you're still chilling, you're enjoying yourself, you're not going, wow, that's kind of an annoying little whine there. Say you're playing a game on this, I love to play Civ 5. You'll hear the fans, but it's sort of like using a gaming notebook. Of course the fans are going to run when you play a game, but it, it's that low background whir. And when I do the same thing on my T-Book 9 Plus or the Dell XPS 12, it's more like a Rah! So you feel like, am I killing this? Hmm. You're not, you're not killing it, but it's nicer. We're going to have a separate gaming video on this, by the way, so you can see some of the gaming performance on this, but expect about 10 frames per second gain in current 3D games. You're not going to play Bioshock Infinite on this at full HD and high settings. It's, it's not a dedicated graphics machine, but at the same time, you are going to get playable 1366 by 768 at low settings, which is something most Ultrabooks can't really attain. Skyrim, you can get the mid-30s if you're going to shoot for low settings. Even you can go up to full HD with that. But again, we'll have a separate video. That gets back to the UX302 again. Again, those final two letters are going to mean a lot there. The, the, the one that they sell at Best Buy for $9.99, that just has Intel HD 4400 graphics, your Core i5 in there. You do get extra USB port on that, which is nice though. And that kind of, you remember the UX32 VD, the, that spirit of, I want the upgradable ultrabook experience with a little low and dedicated graphics. Well you folks overseas are lucky because you can get the UX302 LG which has NVIDIA GT 730M low end dedicated graphics and you can actually open it up and replace the hard drive and cool stuff like that and you get a RAM socket. This guy here a little more locked down. First off let's take a look at those ports here. USB 3.0 port. We get two total of those. There's our combo headphone jack. There is our micro HDMI port. 
and that's where we plug in the power. Now you know ASUS loves to include those dongles and a nice little pouch to carry in. They do the same he thing here and you don't get that nasty ballistic nylon brown thing anymore. You get something that's kind of blue and silky looking that matches this. But anyway, you're going to get a HDMI to VGA adapter in the box and a USB Ethernet adapter. Now on our other side we have Another USB 3.0 port. I always like it when they're on opposite sides so that if you have bulky USB peripherals they're not going to collide with each other. We have a SD card slot here. Card does stick out a bit on this. A lot of Ultrabooks that is true because there's not much room for the internals so for those of you who find that annoying, well there it is. You'll be annoyed. Also here we have a mini display port. So nice, we got two display out ports. We have our mini micro HDMI, we have mini display port. You can drive those plus the internal panel if you want to. See this little thing over here? That's one of the speakers. This has stereo speakers. That really hasn't changed too much from the Zen books of old. They've all done that. They go, we got one here. We got one over there. The usual Bang & Olufsen Ice Power Audio. Little rubber feet on the bottom, some ventilation curvy, kind of a silky finish, does pick up fingerprints. So it is the top, but the top is glass. The neat thing about glass is you can wash it. Okay, this is not an Xperia Z waterproof thing. Don't put it in the faucet. I don't mean that, but you can take a, a damp, very damp rag, wipe it off, clean it. Same thing with the wrist rest area, which actually doesn't get gunky. So pretty cleanable. Also nice thing about that wrist rest area being glass is you know those annoying stickers they plaster all over the wrist rest you can never get off and you're using 90% rubbing alcohol and stuff like that. And these, they just peel right off. I've removed all of them easily. I just left the Intel Iris graphics on there so I could say, look guys, it has an Intel Iris graphics module inside. If I want to get rid of that, voila. Ha! It should always be so easy. And here we have it next to the Samsung Atibook 9 Plus, a competitor for the, shall we say, luxury statement where design, build quality, really high resolution display are important to you. And they're both running the same desktop, and they're both set to one notch below maximum brightness. So you can see how much brighter the ASUS is there. Both styling machines, both beautiful machines, really two different design philosophies, and we close them. The Samsung, of course, runs on standard ULV CPUs, not the, this CPU on steroids kind of thing. But we'll have a separate smackdown of these two, so you can decide between them if you are considering them both. Of course, when it comes to performance, if you get the Zenbook as we have it configured here with that i7 28 watt CPU, you're going to kick the pants off of the Samsung. But that's a discussion again for our SmackDown. Let's talk a little bit more about performance. This has two SanDisk X110 SSD drives, two 128 gig drives configured in a RAID, so 256 gigs total. You can also get with 512 gigs, that's the one that goes up to about $2,200, still has 8 gigs of RAM, DDR3L soldered on board for all these, same high-end CPU inside. And, you know, a couple of years ago with the UX31E Zenbook that ASUS made, the SanDisk wasn't a great performer in that one model, and it, they got a bad name. Okay, give SanDisk a rest. They make some really good solid-state storage here, and obviously Look at the numbers here. For those of you who are notebook geeks or SSD geeks, you'll say those are very good numbers. M2 form factor SSD drives inside and very good read and write numbers. Not quite as good as the 13 inch MacBook Air or the Sony Vio Pro 13 for the sequential up here, but where it really takes off is in the 4K, which is usually a pretty low number in most SSD drives. That means a lot of small writes, which we often do, small caching files, word processing files, that kind of thing. These numbers are pretty much off the charts, so very fast internal storage here, which is something you won't get on the UX302, which actually has a 16 gig caching SSD and a 500 gig conventional spinning hard drive, by the way. So great numbers there. Now moving on to our other benchmark numbers for this machine. As you would expect, there is a considerable performance improvement over your standard Ultrabook on the market currently today. Intel Haswell, again, 5828 for PC Mark 7. And that's about a thousand points higher than we usually see on all the many Ultrabook Haswell units that we reviewed with Core i5 to Core i7. By the way, the Core i5 and Core i7 for the 4200 and 4500U in Ultrabooks, I know a lot of you think, I'm going to get that i7 for a big performance boost. It's not there. The, those are very similar CPUs. This guy is in a different class with the 28-watt CPU. You really will get a performance boost. Getting more RAM, getting a bigger SSD that you usually get with the usual 
i7-4500U upgrade on other Ultrabooks, sure, that part's worth it, but the CPU difference is not so much. They, they benchmark similarly. Obviously, this guy benchmarks a whole lot faster. Now, we have Intel Iris 5100 graphics in here, so that should be better, and in fact, it is better. 3D Mark 11 P for the performance test, 1357. Very good. Usually we see anywhere from the upper 600s to the lower 900s with Intel HD 4400 graphics. So that's enough, like I said, to get you between the CPU boost and the graphics boost, about 10 frames per second more in some current 3D games. W Prime computing Pi in 16.26 seconds, so that is a bit quicker than your usual i5-4200U. And for Cinebench, R15, the CPU score, and that's where it uses the CPU to render, 314, which is better than the 226 and 227 that we saw, say, on the Atibook 9 Plus with the Core i5 and the Dell XPS, also with the Dell XPS 12, that is, also with the Core i5. So you go from about almost 100 points better. So you can see where the CPU really kicks in when you have to do something like, say, rendering. For Geekbench 3, 64 bit test, 32 92 single core, 68 58 multi core. Again, that is scoring higher than we would see on the competing Core i5 and i7s. All comes at a price. Like I said, this guy is expensive, but if you need that kind of power, if you're doing heavy duty things, software development, in video editing, you know if you're one of those people, could be worth the money. Aha, uh -huh, so there's got to be a price to pay somewhere, right? Is it noisy? Is it hot? No, like I said, it's actually pretty darn quiet. It's amazing. It does not get unbearably hot. You can feel some heat over here. This is metal. You'll feel some heat by the, the fan exhaust area, but no, it doesn't get unbearably hot to touch either, so that's very nice. Using core temp to measure CPU temperatures is the usual, what you would expect from these machines. It idles in the upper 30s to mid 40s and pushing it. I was playing Civ 5 and Left 4 Dead 2 with this, which, you know, that's about as taxing as you can get, generally speaking. I would get up to about 70, and this is centigrade temperatures, which is perfectly fine. 100 degrees is the max permissible, and it's good to see Asus actually lets it get that high without throttling. Speaking of throttling, you would think, Aha, this is a CPU that was really meant for 15-inch Ultrabooks. More room for cooling, heat dissipation, all that kind of thing. It must be throttling like crazy, right? This is where ASUS is kicking Sony in the pants right now. As we know, Sony's lately have been kind of hot and really noisy, and they throttle them a whole lot. Now, this thing will, will stay running at full 2.8 gigahertz, no problem. It'll turbo boost up and stay there if it needs to. Not that it needs to as often as other Ultrabooks, but very good there. You're not going to experience a lot of throttling, so you're not paying a penalty with the fact that this is so thin and light. By the way, it weighs three pounds, three pounds and two ounces, so it's about comparable to other Ultrabooks on the market. Okay, how about battery life? That's the other thing that usually would, well, frankly suck on something that has 28 watts. Not bad, because ASUS has a six cell, 50 watt hour battery inside, so it's a pretty beefy battery. It's about comparable to the T-Book 9 Plus battery, which is pretty beefy given the internals that it has. And so far I've averaged about six to six and three quarter hours of mixed use, mostly productivity use. Streaming some video for about 40 minutes, but otherwise using Word, Excel, PowerPoint, web browsing, email, that kind of stuff, your average everyday productivity work. If you're going to be exporting full HD video a whole lot, expect shorter run times on it. If you're going to be playing Civ Unplugged, Civ 5, well, expect shorter run times, but Certainly not bad for the power that's inside. So what's the lesson in all this? You can have all the bells and whistles and everything you want. A beautiful fit and finish, a very nice usable backlit keyboard. Beautiful glass lid on here. Better than, much better than average performance because we have a whole new CPU class going on inside here in Intel Iris 5100 graphics. But it comes at a price right now. So in a way, you know, even if you're saying, I would never spend $2,000 on this, I would love to have it, but no, thank you, that's crazy. This is what the future will bring us. Let's put it that way. So it's, it's interesting. It's in the same way that ABS brakes showed up in sports cars first, and now every car has them. A lot of the goodies that we've got here, they'll trickle down to other laptops. It may take three years, you know, but this is the direction we're heading. So it's neat to see this much power in something this thin and light. And if you are a road warrior who needs style and needs extra power on the go because you don't spend your day mostly in MS office, 
Well, you know, there's really nothing like it. The only other competitor for this with this series of CPUs is the 13-inch MacBook Pro with Retina Display, the revision that we just saw in late 2013. Use the same family of CPUs. Now, if you spec that 13-inch Mac up, then you're looking at about $1,799 or so. It's a $300 CPU upgrade just to go up to the CPU that's also on this. The CPU is about $450 according to Intel versus $225 for your average Core i5-4200U. So you get an idea where the expense is coming from. Anyway, so, and then you throw in the dongle adapters that are included with this, and you're getting close to price parity with the Mac Retina model, that is, but you're getting it in a MacBook Air-like frame. So it's a pretty unique item. Asus says, hey, we can charge what we want. Well, they probably can. So that's the Asus ZenBook UX301 LA, or just 301, it's easier to say that way. I, really a stunning machine, stunning internals, and a stunning price too. If you got the money and you need the speed and the looks, certainly it's worth considering. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.